I'm here today to talk to you, well, actually I'm trying to have a di different conversation today. I thought that would be nice to just have um, a question and answer session with you. So um, I know that you might have some questions that you've been wanting to ask your pediatrician and maybe you haven't been able to get around to it. Um, so I thought it'd be nice to just um, open the floor and have some questions and, um, and if there aren't questions that come in, then I have some topics that I've prepared of things that I get asked a lot in the office. And um, of course, for my disclosures, I don't have any um, uh, financial conflicts. And and everything I say here too, shouldn't be in the place of a uh, senior pediatrician, of course, um, and getting a, a exam done. Okay, so the outline of my presentation is as follows. So uh, question and answer session, as I mentioned. So just open the floor, send in your questions. Even right now, start typing in your questions. Um, I'll start answering them as they come in. Um, and then if I don't get too many questions, then I will just go through some hot topics. So um, I will have my question slide now, just start uh, typing in. Um, so some of the hot topics that I'll go over though um, are questions about, or, or talking about constipation, sleep, uh, mental health, and dry skin, things that um, may seem simple, but uh, I actually get questions about a lot in the office. So um, I thought that it would be nice to go over those things today with you. Um, so if you have any questions, I'll, I'll wait a little bit to see if anything comes in. Um, and then if not, I will move on to my topics. Um, one question that might come up is about COVID and the vaccine. So if that's something that you wanna talk about, we can definitely talk about that right now too. Um, the vaccine has been made available, obviously, for younger kids, five to 11, and I do highly recommend it. Um, it's been shown to be very safe and effective. Um, so that's something that is uh, brand new right now, and we are, we're offering it at Hogue also, so you could make an appointment for your child. And I'll see if there's any questions now. Not yet, okay, not yet. So we'll move on. We'll move on to the topics and then um, if there's anything that comes in though, feel free to send questions my way, okay? Okay, so sleep. So sleep is always a huge topic. I, I can't not talk about sleep um, and not include safe sleep, um, but in general, I feel like when I talk about sleep, it's usually about how to achieve better sleep um, with all age ranges. So it's something that's uh, difficult for families and I'm always here to um, offer any sort of um, advice and support. Um, and the other thing too, actually, with this topic or this talk, um, if you decide that you wanna ask questions later, you think about something later, you can always send it in to or comment on the video Video, and then um, I will see that comment later on and I can respond. So um, oh, feel free to just keep sending questions my way. Um, so in terms of safe sleep, it's very, very important. This is something I talk about a lot, I'm very passionate about. So sudden infant death syndrome is something that is real and it still happens, unfortunately. There's about 3,400 deaths per year. Um, and this is something that um, can be, uh, at least the, the risk of sudden infant death syndrome can be decreased by a couple of things that I have talked about on this slide. So the big thing is back to sleep. So um, the back to sleep campaign was around the 1990s and there was a huge decline in the uh, rates of SIDS. So I'll show you on the next slide. So as you can see, um, the top uh, line there is the SIDS rate, the, the, so the red color, and then the purple color is the, um, the back to sleep. So you can see as the amount of people or babies that were put on their backs um, went up, the rates of SIDS declined dramatically. So that was huge. So all um, every pediatrician will recommend back to sleep. Um, and so that's the safest way to put your baby for sleep. So always put them on their back. And then I always tell my parents too that Otherwise, just make it as boring as possible for your baby when they're sleeping. So you don't want anything in that crib with them. So crib, bassinet, make it as boring as possible. So no bumpers, no blankets, no stuffed animals, no pillows, nothing soft in general. You want a very firm mattress with a fitted sheet. Um, your baby should not crease at all that mattress. Um, that is very unsafe, it's a suffocation risk. Um, you should have your baby also in your room with you. So they should be um, in a bassinet or crib or play yard in the room with you, um, but not necessarily in your bed. The, uh, bed sharing is not recommended. Um, it is actually a SIDS risk and it's also suffocation risk. So that's something that we do not recommend as pediatricians. Um, and then other things you wanna think about are that uh, 
you want your baby to be in, you don't want them to be overheated. So you don't want to put on too many layers of clothing. So generally your baby is comfortable in whatever you're wearing plus one layer. Um, so you don't want to overheat them and do too many swaddles or blankets and obviously nothing loose. Um, and then uh, pacifiers are also shown to potentially decrease the risk of SIDS too. So I'm a fan of pacifiers. Um, you wanna start using a pacifier usually when, once breastfeeding is well established. And that sometimes takes a couple of weeks, but you can even start it earlier um, if everything's going well with the latch. Um, and if you have any questions about the product that you're gonna buy for uh, safe sleeping or for uh, your baby to sleep in, um, you can always go to the Consumer Product Safety Commission, their website, and, and look there to see if there's anything that's been recalled or deemed not safe for your baby. Um, and then the other thing too, uh, flat is something that's really important. Um, Sometimes parents will put maybe a bit of incline if they're congested or if they're spitting up, and that's definitely not recommended. Um, and pillows of any kind are not recommended. So um, nothing for their, the shape of their head. That's not something that you should include in that bed with them. I'm a little sip. Okay. And then the next slide is more about um, sleep expectations. So. This is important too because um, it's good to know that newborns, obviously they sleep a lot, about 16 to 17 hours per day, but they don't sleep in very long stretches in general. So uh, maybe one to two hour stretches at a time. So don't expect too much in terms of long stretches. Some babies do three, four, um, but you should be obviously feeding your baby every three to four hours when they're a newborn. But see that they sleep a lot, so don't be alarmed, 16 to 17 hours per day. And then um, your baby's also usually um, more awake at night than they are during the day and, and when they're newborns. So this is very, um, this is very common. So you know, the night owls, this is very normal. Um, so don't worry either. And that's something that does switch around uh, two months is when they become more awake um, during the day. Okay, and then um, you don't want to sleep train until four months. So that's something that you'll find out there is um, talked about a lot, sleep training. Um, it should not be started until four months, despite what you might read or hear. Um, your baby needs to be developmentally ready before they are able to be sleep trained. And um, so that's something that you should definitely ask your pediatrician about. Um, and they need to be growing well too. So I would not start anything until you talk with your pediatrician. And then uh, around four months of life, you should expect about six hour stretches for your baby for sleeping. So once you start sleep training, don't think that it's gonna be a 10 to 12 hour stretch at night. So six hours is usually the expectation at that time. And then six months is when we expect a little bit longer stretches. If, if everything's going well, eight to 12 hour stretches at night is usually what's expected. It's really nice. Okay, so for healthy habits, so a lot of parents ask me about this too. So what can you do um, before you start sleep training? What can you do to try to help yourself, uh, set up yourself for success with sleeping at night? So um, again, no co-sleeping, not only is that a risk for SIDS, but that's something that can get in the way of your baby being able to just sleep on their own. Um, and then something that a lot of people don't know about is putting them to sleep when they're drowsy. So not while they're um, asleep yet. So basically um, when your baby is in your arms and you're holding them or wherever, whatever you're doing, if they're starting to fall asleep, then put them in their bed Don't or the crib. Don't wait until they're actually asleep first. Um, for one thing, they will end up, if they wake up, they'll be startled that they're no longer in your arms and that will alert them and um, then they'll be up a lot quicker than you expected. And then for the other thing, they just won't get used to their environment as much. So they won't get used to being in their crib and their, in their uh, bassinet um, and being able to know that that's a comfortable place for them to sleep. And then you also want to, this seems like a no-brainer, but you want to interact with your baby when they're awake. So um, this doesn't mean to keep your child up. So not necessarily trying to force them to stay awake during the day. I've had that question before too. Um, but you do want to interact with them. So while they're awake, you want to be stimulating them, playing with them, reading to them, um, talking with them, and, um, and then that will help with um, better success at night too. And then at night, you do want to make it as calm and quiet as possible for the feeds. So you don't want to obviously turn on a bunch of lights and make a bunch of noise. Um, you want to be calm and quiet when you're feeding at night.
And then um, another thing is too, you don't always have to jump to every sound that your baby makes. So if you think that they are crying, um, they might make like a little noise and it might not actually need to be addressed. So give it some time, kind of listen a little bit, see if the, your baby will be okay with just soothing back to sleep um, because they may not even need you at all. It might just be a noise that they're making um, for no reason. Okay, so sleep training. Okay, so this is definitely talked about a lot. So I'm not going to go through all the methods, but I'm just going to go through the overall um, ideas behind it and the things that you want to aim to do. So again, they need to be developmentally ready. So that's around four months. So um, your baby needs to be able to self-soothe, and that's not achieved until four months. And then... Um, Prior to this too, you're developing this relationship with your with your baby, this bond that you're trying to um, instill secure security, and you want them to know that they can rely on you and that you can they can depend on you to be there for them when they need you. Um, so you don't want to break that bond. And so once once they realize, I mean, once that is developed, that's usually by four months where you really develop that strong bond and that secure bond, and they know that you're there for them. Um, so you don't have to worry about you know parents worry about you know. Tra traumatizing them if you start sleep training then that's as long as you haven't tried anything beforehand and you're really interacting them and engaging them and loving them and they they know they know you're there for them they know that they, they can rely on you um, and then the self-soothing like I said they bring their hands to their mouth and they start to be able to soothe themselves and so they don't rely on you as much for that uh, around four months and then um, again check with your pediatrician because you want to make sure that they are developmentally ready and they're growing well um, and then overall too, um, the bottom line with all the methods out there, there's tons of methods out there. The bottom line is that consistency is the key to all the methods. So if you, if you choose one, stick with it. And it also depends on the parenting style. So I never really recommend one method um, because it depends on how you are as a parent and, and what kind of uh, way you wanna approach it. But um, get on the same page with your partner. You need to all be doing the same thing and then stick with it. So um, whatever you do, try to stick with it for at least five days and know that the first two days will probably be the worst things will probably get a lot worse than they were before um, so anticipate that so i would do it um, over a long weekend or at least a weekend or that you may not have a lot going on knowing that the first two nights were probably really bad but don't give up on it because usually if you stick with it uh, it gets a lot better um, and then it usually gets a lot better by day four five and then at that point your baby will get used to it um, and then they'll develop the new habit the other thing is too, peeling off the layers is one um, important thing. So if you've developed some bad habits um, or just habits that you know may not be the best for sleep, um, uh, you want to just take one thing at a time. So if you have been holding your baby um, to go to sleep and have just held on to them and not put them in a crib for a while, which happens, um, you want to start with that first in terms of uh, when you're trying to start sleep training. So, okay, putting your baby down when they're drowsy. Or if you've been rely the baby, your baby's been relying on a bottle, like right before bed. Um, start with one of those things first. So s try one thing, stick with it, make the next change, and give every change about five days to a week before you start the new one. You don't want to be throwing too many things at them at once. Okay, and then more about uh, sleep expectations. Okay, so uh, for your one to two year olds, you expect that they should be sleeping around 11 to 14 hours um, per day, and that's with naps and um, overnight. And then three to five year olds are about 10 to 13 hours of sleep per day, um, and that's again including naps and overnight. And then your six-year-olds to 12-year-olds, it's about nine to 12 hours of sleep per day, and, or per night, sorry. And then your 13-year-olds to 18-year-olds should be getting about eight to 10 hours of sleep per night. And then um, for older kids and teens, so again, the bottom line, consistency, uh, you need to develop a nice routine. So you need to be doing the same thing. So I tell parents, it's actually, it's really hard. Sleep is really hard. Um, you need to have everything in line. You need to be doing the same thing over and over again, um, being consistent with it. And life is just not consistent. So that's what makes it difficult. But basically, uh, weekdays, weeknights need to be the same thing. Um, and then in terms of good sleep uh, hygiene, basically about a half an hour to an hour before bed, your child or teen needs to be doing the same thing every night. So winding down, less stimulation, um, you need to 
decrease or not decrease, eliminate screen time about half an hour to an hour before bed. Screen time includes TV, your iPhone, your uh, iPad, anything like that. Um, you want to do something calming, so maybe taking a bath, you want to read for pleasure, um, obviously brushing your teeth, um, sometimes listening to calming music, but choose the same thing every night and do the same thing, same order too. Um, that helps your body to retrain itself and know that, okay, we're getting ready for bed. Um, and then you want to not try to eat at least an hour before bed also, and then um, don't exercise too late at night, and then less uh, drinking fluids too, so um, right before bed, so about an hour before bed, because um, that will help you to not wake up in the middle of the night. Um, and then overall, to achieve good sleep, like I said, it is hard because everything has to be in line. So you want to be very healthy with your eating habits, eating three meals a day, two snacks. You want to get enough exercise and you want to try to decrease stress. So all these things are really hard to do. Um, but in general, sleep is mainly about your lifestyle and what you're doing. Um, some concerns that you would definitely want to bring up with your pediatrician, uh, things that would be more of an organic issue, would be loud and disruptive snoring, uh, choking. Obviously, if your snoring is ca causing you to choke, uh, apnea, which is when you s um, stop breathing. These are all things you most likely would bring up on your own with your pediatrician, but obviously I have to mention it. Um, that's more uh, symptoms consistent with, with um, OSA or obstructive sleep apnea. And then urinating in the middle of the night too, that's something that we want to know about also. Okay, so with that, that's my um, topic on sleep and the things I talk about the most in my office. Didn't know if anyone had any questions about sleep, about your baby, or about your uh, child, or teen, or yourself even. Um, anything that you might think of, I'll give it a few minutes to see if anything comes in. I do ask about too about the um, the temperature in the room too for your baby. So the cooler the better the better for Sid. So um, you want the temperature in your baby's room to be about 69 to 72 degrees. Um, that's the healthy range or the safe range for uh, temperature. Again, you don't want to overheat your baby. Okay, if there's no questions, I'll move on. And um, again, you can you can uh, post any questions if you think about it later on. Okay, constipation, so talking about poop. So I talk about poop a lot too. So um, if you have any questions about poop, bring, send it on in. Um, I'm, I love to talk about it. Um, so for infant stooling, it's obviously a lot different than uh, your child stooling, your teen stooling. Um, so just overall going through things to uh, expect when your baby's born. So uh, the first few days of life, your baby's gonna have a black sticky meconium. That's the stool is gonna be this thick, thick consistency that later transitions to a brown yellow loose stool so it takes about three days or so for that to change um, so don't be surprised and then in terms of how many times your baby will stool per day that varies like it's a, a huge range so I get this question a lot too um, if your baby skips poops is that um, okay and it's actually definitely okay so some babies have multiple poops per day so like squirts even and that's okay um, they might have a poop like that every single time they have a diaper change you might see a poop and that's totally normal um, and then some people or some babies might skip many days um, up to seven days can be totally normal um, as long as everything else is fine so as long as your baby is uh, eating okay um, comfortable they have their belly is soft they're not vomiting they're growing well, all those things. As long as all those things, things are fine and they're skipping days and the poops are not coming out in a problematic way, which I'll talk about in a minute, then it's completely normal. Um, we still want you to run that by your pediatrician first though, especially if it's a newborn. Um, so problems with poops when they come out, obviously if they're hard and pebbly, um, white, black, or red, so those are things, the colors that we really don't like, but all the other colors are fine. So I get a lot of questions about green stools and green stools are totally normal, so don't worry about that. Um, and then also know that uh, stooling habits change a lot. So your infant, your newborn, will not stool the same way as your four month old, obviously. It's probably um, um, something that everyone already knows, but um, in the beginning, they might have five to six poops a day. Um, and then by four months, three months, they might have one, maybe one every other day, maybe one every three or four days, you know? So, um, and that's totally normal and it's not worrisome. But again, as long as everything else is fine. So always check with your pediatrician first.
Okay, so for infant, const infant constipation, this is definitely something that your pediatrician will want to hear about because we do want to make sure that your infant's growing well if, um, if the, poop the poops are coming out abnormal. So hard stools, pebbly stools, discomfort, like a lot of crying um, while they're trying to poop. Um, and then the infrequent bowel movements, that's mainly if there's been a big change. So maybe they went from having three or four a day to skipping several days. We will want to know about that. Um, also know though, um, when it comes to discomfort, um, I'm talking more about if it seems like they're in pain while they're pooping. Um, babies in general do um, strain a little bit um, and that's normal because their abdominal muscles aren't very strong, they're laying flat, and those are all um, reasons why it's kind of hard to get their poop out. So they're gonna be making some sounds and squirming and, um, and that's normal. But if they're crying and it comes out, of course, if there's a little bit of blood, if it's hard, then obviously that's abnormal. Um, and for babies with their constipation, usually it's surrounding some change. So um, a introduction of solids, change in diet, change in formula, change from breast milk to formula. Um, typically that can definitely trigger constipation, um, but it can also just happen for no reason at all. So um, always contact your pediatrician. Again, we'll wanna make sure that your baby's growing well. We wanna get a good diet history uh, and do a good physical exam. Okay. So for older children, um, the same thing, we look for a lot of the same uh, symptoms, so the, or the signs, so the hard stools, pebbly stools, discomfort, infrequent bowel movements. Um, but then the other thing that I feel like parents don't know about is large poops. So if your baby or your child is having a poop that's pretty sizable and you're pretty surprised by it, it could also be constipation, especially for a young child. So a two-year-old, three-year-old that's having a giant poop, um, that, that's definitely a red flag for us. We think that there might be a little constipation going on. Um, and then of course straining. So if they're sitting there really pushing hard as a, um, an older child, that's something that um, shouldn't be happening because they're sitting up. Um, they're sitting up, they have stronger abdominal muscles, so they're in a good position to poop versus a baby where they're, like I said, laying down, weaker muscles. Um, so they shouldn't be straining when they're older. Um, and then generally for them too, it does happen in a transition period. So uh, starting school, potty training, so definitely look out for it during those times. Um, and know that treatment's very, very important. So getting on top of it and not being ashamed or afraid to ask your pediatrician about it um, and anticipate sometimes if it's been a long or a prolonged issue, you can it might take months and months to treat um, and that's okay, um, but stick with it. It's better to be aggressive and treat it than wait because then you might fall into this vicious cycle and it can get worse and worse over time. So your baby or your child will not want to poop because it hurts, so they'll hold their poop and then they get more constipated and backed up and then when they poop, it really hurts, and then it just keeps, you know, making a vicious cycle, and, and it's really hard to come back from. Um, and then also know that um, constipation usually isn't caused by anything organic. Usually it's not a um, worrisome cause, or there's usually, usually not a reason why. Like, we can't even find a reason sometimes. Um, so don't worry, but still, we do want to check. We'll have to, you know, obviously go through our questions and our exam to make sure that there's nothing medically wrong, um, but typically there's not anything wrong. Um, and then, in general, what you want to do to help with constipation, and even preventing constipation, obviously, is very important. So that's mainly what you want to do is prevent this problem. Um, high fiber foods, so I know it's probably a given, but dark fruits, whole grains, vegetables, beans, plenty of water, um, and small amounts of juices will help too. So prune juice, grape juice, those have a lot of fiber in it, and it helps, to, um, helps with the bowel movements. Um, I, I do like more of the, um, the real foods though, so rather than prune juice as much, just give prunes, but prune juice also really helps a lot too. Um, and then regular toileting habits are really important, especially if your child is starting to not want to poop uh, frequently, they're having hard stools. Um, retraining their body is very important. So um, you want them to be uh, basically have a meal and then about 20 minutes after that, or sorry, eat and then sit on the toilet for about 20 minutes. And um, then that retrains your body to um, start having more frequent stools. Um, worrisome signs, I actually didn't mention it, but worrisome things, obviously bloody bloody stools is, is worrisome. Um, if there's leakage, that means, like, meaning that if you're leaking poop, um, that's something that we do, that's basically means that the constipation's gone for a pretty long time and it's gonna probably need some pretty aggressive treatment. So definitely, definitely contact your uh, pediatrician if you're noticing anything like that.
Okay, so questions. I know we haven't had a lot so far, but if you have any questions about poop, you can send them over right now. No poopy questions is what I've been told. <laughs> but again, green, okay, the, one of the main questions I get, green poops are fine. I get that question a lot. Um, you don't want to have mucus in poop though. So um, anything that looks like snot, that's not good. Um, and then sometimes too, sometimes a little tiny bit of blood is okay sometimes, um, but, but always contact your pediatrician. That, may, that might mean that there's a little bit of irritation around the um, anus, um, or there was a little thing that they were just kind of working through, but it shouldn't happen over and over again, um, obviously. So um, contact us if there's any issues. Um, it doesn't always mean something really horrible. That's kind of what I'm getting at. Um, but always run it by your pediatrician. No questions, right? Okay, no questions. Okay, so dry skin is a very simple topic, um, I, but I get questions about it all the time. So um, we can talk about some um, help, ways to help prevent uh, dry skin. So I see it a lot on exam too, so that's another thing. It kind of comes up out of um, something that parents actually don't bring up, like I'll just notice it. Um, so so um, there's obviously ranges of severity of uh, dry skin. So um, Again, need your pediatrician take a look at you to see if there's anything really worrisome going on. But in general, obviously everyone knows what dry skin most likely looks like. Um, but in order to treat it, you wanna, um, or to prevent it to uh, try to avoid hot baths and showers. Um, that dries out your skin. And then you wanna use a soap that's very, very basic. So you don't wanna have any additives or fragrances. I know that smells nice, um, having you know, a little lavender there and something like that, but that typically irritates the skin more. So the more basic, the better when it comes to um, treating dry skin or even just avoiding or preventing it in general. Um, and then you want to avoid, uh, you want to, sorry, you want to moisturize as often as possible. So um, lotions don't really help very much. So there's a lot of lotions out there. They're actually not very helpful when it comes to dry skin. So emollients, so basically a high oil, low water content um, and cream. So the thicker, the better. Um, and then I'll show you some examples on my next slide as to what we really like as pediatricians and dermatologists. Um, and then you want your um, child and uh, yourself too, if you're suffering from this, you want to stay hydrated, so drink a lot of water. I know I'm drinking my water right now, but that helps to uh, hopefully prevent uh, dry skin or and also treat it too. So these are some of the things, um, the creams and emollients we love as pediatricians. So Vaseline is something that parents don't really think about when it comes to treating dry skin, but hardly anyone ever reacts to Vaseline um, and it works really, really well. And it's usually pretty cheap too. Uh, CeraVe is great. I love it. I use it all the time for myself. I use it every night. Uh, and Aquaphor too, I use it all the time for my kids. So these are three really great um, uh, creams or emollients that you can use for your child or yourself. Okay, so that's the end of that topic. So if there's any questions about dry skin, I'll give it a few minutes to see if anything comes in. And if not, I'll talk about my last topic. And then if you think of anything that's not about any of this stuff, shoot it in too. I think, okay, all right. So we'll move on to the last topic. Okay, so mental health. So this is becoming a lot more of a problem right now. Um, especially in our kids. And so um, I thought it would be important to talk about it. Um, obviously I can talk about mental health a lot. I can talk about any of these topics a lot. So um, so this is something that, um, don't be afraid to bring it up with your pediatrician and um, and also acknowledging it in your child is really important. So um, here are some of the symptoms you wanna look out for. So infants and young children, they have a lot of different symptoms than your older child would or your adolescent when it comes to depression, anxiety. So you might notice um, change in eating habits, sleeping habits, toileting habits. Um, you might see a regression in the, their development. And then you might notice they might start requiring more attention than usual. So, so these are some things you wanna pay attention to. Um, and then older children and adolescents, you might see withdrawal, you might see excessive worrying, argumentative, um, I'm sorry, argumentativeness, aggression, defiance, um, and then physical complaints. Um, across the board, you might see um, kids with abdominal pain, headaches, fatigue, um, insomnia, lack of motivation. So these are things that you wanna be looking out for. And don't just chalk it up to, oh yeah, they're just being a teen. You know, that's not something you wanna um, really, you, you wanna pay attention to it. So ways to help. So um, obviously lots of love and support across the board for your child. <laughs> you wanna offer a lot of love, a lot of support. Know that they want 
you want them to know that you're there for them, you're there to listen to them um, and be there for them. Um, for younger children, they really love consistency. <laughs> That's like the uh, motto of my talk today. Um, and they love structure. So really keeping things normal for them you know, keeping them in a routine. Um, and for older children and adolescents, um, open communication is, is, is huge. So they need to know that you're there for them and um, that you are going to be uh, not judging the things that they're asking you about um, and the things that you are t talking to you about. And then you also want to um, put some limits on screen time. So that's how uh, definitely a way to help. Because um, when you get so sucked into uh, your phone, um, to your uh, computer, your iPad, uh, you start to lose sight of everything around you. And um, I think we have a question, so I can stop and all. Oh, poop question. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, is it normal for a baby to poop five times daily at nine months? Yes, yes. So as long as the poop is um, coming out in a not an abnormal fashion. So um, if it's all the things I mentioned, the things that you would worry about, like for constipation, um, but then five times a day, as long as it doesn't seem like, because they're nine months, as long as it doesn't seem like like diarrhea. So usually around nine months, it seem, it's formed-ish. It's more of like a pasty, uh, like a peanut butter type consistency at that point. Um, might have a little bit of um, sh a shape to it too, but it should still be soft. Um, as long as they're growing great, they're not spilling out their diaper every single time and shooting out. Um, those are things that I'd worry about five times a day. Um, obviously discomfort, but this can be totally normal. Thanks for the question. Okay, and then um, back to uh, mental health so yes and then um, finally so the things that you always want to um, stress uh, for mental health it's, it's kind of like it's kind of like you're sleeping too you need to have everything come in line and so it's, it's really hard so um, you need good sleep so we talked about how hard good sleep is so I know that's really hard but it's really plays a huge role uh, uh, with your mental health and then exercise is huge so there have been several studies showing the benefits of exercise for your mental health um, compared to antidepressants exercise can be just as effective um, and then healthy eating habits, again, you don't want to be skipping meals. Um, you want to be eating three meals a day, two snacks. Um, and then spending uh, quality time with your family. So back to the limiting screen time, trying to um, be with your family, take some walks, get some fresh air. It's really, really important. Um, and doing it all together as a family is huge too. So getting everyone involved, it'll really benefit everyone. And of course, therapy, therapy is huge. So don't be afraid to reach out. Um, I know right now it seems like therapy is really hard to come by and that's really unfortunate. Um, but we do have ways to try to help through it. And the more we seek it and the more we um, try to find better avenues of getting therapy and getting help, more of it will become available. So um, don't be afraid to reach out. Don't get discouraged. That's another thing I think that happens sometimes too, is that parents get discouraged and they can't find help. Um, and then we don't know if we, that's happening. So reach out to us and we'll use every method we can to get you help. Okay. And that's pretty much all for my uh, talk today. So. Um, I wanted to talk, have, it, have it be more of interactive with a lot of questions, so I didn't prepare it uh, a lot. Um, but if you have any questions now, feel free to shoot them my way. And again, too, if you have any questions after this is over, um, you can leave them in the comment section, and um, I will answer those questions. Even you know, weeks later, I've heard that they'll um, uh, they'll come to me, and I'll I'll answer them. So um, so yeah, if there's no questions, I'll wait a little bit to see if anything comes in. If there's any other questions that I can think about for my day-to-day uh, -day encounters. Um, so I guess back to the COVID vaccine talks, I feel like that's something I get all the time right now. Um, so in terms of the, uh, the vaccine itself for kids, um, again, shown to be very safe, very effective. Um, it, the, the five to 11 year range um, showed 100% um, decrease in hospitalizations, obviously. Um, so that's why I really recommend the COVID vaccine in general. Um, it decreases the risk of hospitalizations um, by far. Um, so getting COVID in general, it, you have a lot higher risk of, of complications and hospitalizations from COVID. From the vaccine, once you have the vaccine, you can still get COVID. It does happen, even though it's very effective. Um, but when you get COVID, it usually have a lot milder symptoms. So, um, 
So majority of uh, kiddos that end up in the, the hospital or the ICU are the ones that have not been vaccinated. So that's why it's super important to get. Um, and, and then I do get a lot of questions about myocarditis too. Um, parents are worried about that with the, uh, the vaccine. Um, and that um, has been proven to be a very, very rare um, complication um, in the, uh, the adolescent um, population. And they did not see any cases of myocarditis in the trials for the five to 11 range, but um, there weren't enough um, uh, kids in the trials to actually really say that it, there wasn't, there, that wouldn't be a possibility. Um, but generally though, the risk of getting COVID um, is a lot higher. And then the complications from COVID itself and getting myocarditis from COVID are a lot higher than getting it from the vaccine. Um, so that's something I tell my parents too. So I definitely encourage it. Um, I think it's very important for not only your child's health, but also in terms of um, protecting those around you that some people that can't get the vaccine, um, others that don't, aren't getting vaccinated for some reason, but they are a high risk, you know, protect them too. Okay, I have a question. Okay, so the question is, so I have to know how old this baby is. So I don't know if you can um, ask back, but the question is, is it normal for my baby to get up every four hours to eat? She doesn't sleep at night. So it'd be normal if they're a newborn or up to four months. Nine months, okay, so at nine months, that would be unusual. So usually at six months and up, we expect stretches of eight to 12 hours straight without eating. Um, so that means that we probably at, at nine months, there's definitely things to work on. Um, I'm assuming, I'm hoping that your baby is growing well. Um, and I'm sorry that she's still waking up or he is still waking up that much. And I know that's probably really hard. Um, but if there's been any, or she, she, um, if there have been any habits that have been developed um, that, that you have recognized to be maybe not the healthiest of habits. So from this talk, you might want to start peeling back those layers. So taking it one step at a time. Um, and making one positive change, give that five days, knowing that the first two days are gonna be really rough, um, but stick with it. And then once you've achieved, once once she has gotten used to that one change, then make the next change. Um, and then also it's really important to have a nice structure and routine. I don't think I, I went over that, but um, once their babies, your baby is four months and up, during the day, it's really important for them to eat and sleep at the same time. So, um, so you want, you know, baby wakes up around seven or 6.30 and you have, um, you, um, you feed them and they have a nap, you know, like a couple hours later. Basically you're doing the same thing though um, every day. So for your nine month old, um, it kind of depends on how many uh, naps they have. They might have two naps, they might have one, maybe three, um, but have those naps be the exact same time uh, during the day and then have their eating times be the exact same time too. Um, make sure that your baby's still getting a lot of uh, enough calories too. So whether it's formula or breast milk, they still need to be um, eating around 24 ounces in a 24 hour period, even at nine months. Um, and then the uh, solids are incorporated too. So the solids should be around usually three times a day at that point. Um, so, you know, make sure they're well fed during the day. Um, and then making it structured and a uh, nice routine. Um, so that usually sets you up for success at night too. Um, and then from there, um, peeling back any sort of um, bad habits that you've uh, maybe have um, picked up on, or if you haven't, then um, knowing that they don't need to eat at night. So um, at nine months usually. Um, so that's one thing you can change. So if you are feeding your baby at night every four hours, um, start with one feed that you think, okay, maybe they're not really um, eating that much at that feed. So say it's like a 2 a.m. feed and they eat like for five minutes or something, or they eat like two ounces. Know that you can probably cut that out and then stick with that for five days and then um, see how long of a stretch you got there and then see which one's next. So if there's one before then that you can maybe cut out, one after that they can maybe cut out um, to keep slowly increasing that length of time. Um, and then when you do that, um, when they're w still waking up, then that the way you intervene at that point um, depends on your style. So that's kind of like where the sleep training comes in. So um, you wanna soothe them. So some people, okay, well, you don't, there is the cried out, obviously, way, and then there's soothing. Um, 
So, uh, and there's a, bu a bunch of methods out there that you can choose to do a mixture of one or the other. Um, but whatever you end up doing, uh, do the same thing. So of course you can do cry it out. Um, you can also just soothe by, um, by going in, addressing your baby, um, if they're in a different room by that point, um, and singing to them, talking to them, obviously very quiet, uh, making them feel comforted, um, but not picking them up out of their bed. That's another thing that to, to that parents do. You pick them up out of their bed, it alerts them, they get used to it, they like it. Um, so keep them in their bed, um, and then just soothe them from um, just being right there with them. And then doing that same thing though, like so again, same thing every night, um, and stick with it, and hopefully, hopefully that helps. Um, and then, uh, like I said, there's a lot of methods out there. So read what seems to um, seems to be something you're comfortable with, because you need to be comfortable with what you're doing. You also need your partner to be comfortable with what you're doing. Um, and and um, there's also, if all else fails, I mean, obviously talk to your pediatrician, but if all else fails, there, there are some um, sleep specialists out there too that, um, that can come in and help if you're just at your wit's end and you've been trying this for a while and you're just, you know, um, really, really exhausted. Um, they can really tease out every single thing that's happening at home and during the day and at night to really help you get better sleep. And I hope that, hope that things get better. Okay, so I have some more questions. Okay. Okay, so, okay, so the uh, next question, the follow-up on that is, how long can you let them cry for? Okay, okay. Okay, yeah, so, yeah, so if you don't want, so this seems like, yeah, if, if you don't really want to let them cry, it is, it is hard, so there are methods that, um, that you don't have to do the cry it out method, um, but there's also methods that you can do a gradual, um, small, um, basically you're working up to, um, so I probably should read this question out loud. Um, okay, so when I check on her after 10 minutes, she sees me and gets even more upset. How do I go about sleep training? Is it hard to let them cry? Or it's hard to let them cry. How long do you let them cry? Um, so it's up to your comfort level. So. Um, so as I said, there are different methods and there are different approaches. So. Um, like baby wise, there's some ways that that's one of the approach where you can slowly go in there and um, you spend a few minutes, just like a couple minutes. And it's like the extinction method where um, you kind of slowly back off on the amount of time that you spend in the room. Um, for me, I'm kind of more of a um, all or nothing type person. So <laughs> with my kids, I kind of just uh, stuck with one thing. I didn't really do like a gradual approach. Um, but, but especially if, if you're having a hard time with letting them cry, um, then, then you can soothe them while you're in the room, but you can soothe them for a certain amount of time each time. So, so you might want to look into one of those methods that um, basically it gives you a time frame to spend in that room, and then you give them some more time, and then you go back in there, spend a little bit less time, go back out, go back in, and um, it might take some time, but, um, but a lot of parents feel like that's a lot more, um, they find that a lot more easy to do versus letting them cry. Um, and then, and then how long you let them cry for, that's, yeah, that's up to you too. So I know it's hard, but usually it does get better. Um, so if you s choose one thing and maybe you're going in there for a little bit and then you go out and you go in a little more, you might notice that over time their cry will get less and less. Um, but again, you're not torturing your child. So even if you let them cry for a couple hours, I know it sounds really bad, <laughs> but, but it's not, you're not torturing them. So at nine months, um, your baby knows that you love her and that you're there for her and that you, you, she needs sleep just as much as you do. And it's very important for her development. It's very important for her to get sleep. So um, you're not torturing her if you let her cry for a long time. Um, sometimes um, parents though, have a really hard time with it. So I did, I did more of a cried out <laughs> with my child, uh, my children. Um, and for my first, I did have to leave. Um, my husband did, you know, more of that. And then it, you know, it was like an hour and a half. It sounds horrible, but it's not, it's not, it's your, my baby was okay. They love me and, um, they were developmentally ready for it. Um, and, and then things got better every night. So, um, and now they both sleep 12 hours a night and they're both, um, so one, my, my baby is nine months and my other, my older child is 12 or 12, <laughs> two years and they both sleep 12 hours at night. Um, they've been doing that since they were, uh, six months. So, um, so not that I'm like, you know, obviously um, perfect at what I, you know, 
teach and do, but um, I, I do, I have seen a lot of parents come through and I have talked with a lot of people about this. Um, and it does depend though on your comfort level of what you um, want or how you want to approach it. So I've definitely also have a lot of people that do not want to do cry down. That's totally fine. Um, and there's, you can soothe in other ways. And then also some babies just don't respond well to soothing. <laughs> it sounds weird, but, but, um, with my son, I actually wanted to see if I can just soothe him first um, without doing a cry it out. And when, it, when I went in there, he would just get w way more riled up. Um, okay, so I have five more minutes left. Um, so he would just go nuts when I went in the room, even if I was trying to soothe him. It just made things a lot more out of control. Um, so that's why we ended up saying, okay, I know he's fine. I know he knows he loves us or we love him. He loves us. We're not torturing him. It's actually making it worse when we go in the room. Um, so this is how we're gonna approach it. Um, so hang in there. I know it's hard, um, but your pediatrician's there for you. I'm here. Um, ask more questions about it. Um, there's a lot of methods out there. Um, and then, like I said, if, if you've tried everything, I'm sure you've tried a lot of things already. Um, there are sleep specialists that they do come at a price, but I've definitely had um, patients and friends um, say that it was the best thing that they've ever done um, because sleep is so important too for you um, and for them. And if it's, you've gone nine months without sleep, it's really, really hard. So um, hang in there, you, you know, you're doing a great job um, and it will get better. Okay, so I think that's all for today. And thank you so much for hanging out with me. And um, this was fun. And I hope that um, some of your questions were answered, even if we didn't um, have a lot of questions. I know that the topics hopefully were helpful. Um, and again, shoot some questions um, my way, um, send some things in the comments. And then if I see them, I'll, um, I will see them and then I'll respond. Um, and uh, hopefully that's helpful. So anyways, I hope you all have a great day and uh, take care.